I'm Leela Singh, your podcast host, and I'd like to welcome you to the My Brand HQ podcast, all things personal branding for career acceleration. This podcast is for talented, ambitious career professionals like you who are wanting to be perceived as a thought leader, to be top of mind to those that matter, and to make an impact and stand out, be that in your team, your organization, or your industry and to be inspired by other successful leaders. I will be interviewing high achieving career professionals who have carved out a successful career in their field and are open to sharing their career journey, their challenges, their learnings and insights with you, someone who is looking to establish your personal brand and accelerate your career. Through my personal branding and coaching practice, I enable career professionals primarily in the technology industry to earn more money to increase their salary. In fact, I spoke to all of my past clients that I've worked with over the several years and learned that actually overall, they've received an average of 47% increase in their package. Would that be a great place to be? They've also all achieved at least one, if not more promotions or moved on to a higher level in their career at another organization. And they're looking to advance their career while showing up as the best version of themselves. If this sounds like you, then do reach out to me and let's have a chat. And why do I do this? Well, during my corporate career spanning 25 years, I quickly realized that hard work alone was not enough to get me to where I wanted to be and the success that I strive for. My belief is that hard work coupled with creating and establishing a strong personal brand can both influence and accelerate your career and get you to where you want to be. In this episode of My Brand HQ, I am speaking with Jeremy Siddharth. Jeremy is the Chief Executive Officer of Aptitudes Software Group PLC, a fast-growing global software business listed on the London Stock Exchange. He has spent 30 years in technology, starting at the very bottom, selling his first desktop PCs to customers in a retail store. With limited formal qualifications, but with shrewd judgment along the way, he worked in startups in his 20s, global tech businesses in his 30s, and achieved his latest ambition to be the CEO of a PLC tech business in his 40s. With plenty left to achieve in his career, Jeremy will share some of his personal learnings about how to get on in business whilst always remembering to live in the moment. In this episode, Jeremy shares with us the significance of understanding early on what lights you up, his belief in the power of the collective and getting the best out of others, powerful questions he asks himself that enables career success and big decision making, the importance of ambition and how this evolved his career, his non-negotiable values and core traits of personal leadership, how having the courage to say no makes for an even bigger yes, and how you can leverage your competitive advantage to stand out in a crowded market. Let's head over and hear what Jeremy has to say. Jeremy, good morning and welcome to My Brand HQ. How are you doing today? Yeah, very well, very well. How are you, Leela? I'm very well. It's great to have you here. Thank you for taking time because I know you're a very, very busy man. Um, I'd like to kick straight off by asking you to to share with me your journey to discovering your passion. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And I think um, I think trying to work out what your passion is, if you can work that out in your in your professional and your personal life, you know, you are halfway there. But I think most of us spend most of our lives trying to get there. Um, but I guess at the heart of me, I'm a very, very social animal. Um, and so actually being able to engage with people and collaborate with people, um, help solve people's problems um, is at the heart, of, um, is at the heart of, of who I am. And so, you know, when I was growing up and thinking about, well, what did I want to do with a, with a, as a career? No one ever sort of has that conversation with you at school. They talk to you about, you know, what, what, what roles you could do. They, they very, very rarely talk to you about, well, what actually lights you up and, and what, what, what gets you going. Um, and I have to say that that probably had quite a big impact on my appetite for uh, academic uh, excellence or study, shall we say, because, you know, I'm a big believer that there's a huge amount, you know, hiding behind uh, behind the books or behind the, 
the, uh, the, the academic uh, activity for, for my children. And I think every child needs to, needs to find what that is. But for me, that engagement um, started when I, uh, I, I literally work, was working in my father's butcher shop. And I started there at, at age 11, um, at the, at actually in the back, making pies and, and make, making sausages and all this sort of stuff. And, and interestingly, I'm sure no one would, would be allowed at the age of 11 to, to work in any kind of environment at all. But uh, and the age was less important. It was more about my, my father said, if you can reach the back of the the back of the uh, the desk that you're working on, or, or, the, or the back of the table you're working on, then you can come to work. But what that meant was that I was I was seeing kind of almost the very start of a supply line. Um, and then over time, I ended up in, in 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 the shop and serving over the counter, and I just found that interaction with uh, with, with with customers amazing. Uh, the mental arithmetic of, of, of adding up on, on the fly without calculators, um, suddenly I got a, a level of, uh, oh, I, under, I understand kind of why maths is so important. Um, and that progressed. And, and actually, before I was wor working age, I'd done a number of different different roles, everything from um, working in the butchers to working in a, a supermarket to working in a clothes shop um, to working in a, in a car sales garage. But all, that, that the common thread there was engagement with other people. And I think that engagement isn't just when you're in a, in a sales situation, but it's how you get the best out of an individual, how you get the best out of a team, how you get the best out of yourself. Um, and that has probably steered me more on my, on my, on my career path and probably uh, is, is why I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing the role I am today rather than, uh, rather than any kind of, you know, a big career plan or big career path or big academic achievement over that period of time. Yeah, and I, and I love the fact that it, it's you're very people centric, and that that's the part that you picked up on because I think a lot of people still talk about the fact that we need to have the skills and the attributes, the experience, but actually it's about the attitude and 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 the people engagement that can make a huge difference both to our own experience in our career, but also um, the impact of the people around us, whether it's our internal customers, colleagues, and external customers in some cases. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and I fundamentally believe people wake up every day wanting to have a good day and wanting to make a difference. And I think if you can unlock that in an individual or you can unlock it in a team or, or in, even better still, so you can unlock it in a in a company or an environment or an organisation. Um, amazing things happen. You know, I'm a huge believer in the power of the collective. Um, and actually, if everyone has a common goal, everyone has a common view, um, you, that extra 5, 10, 15 percent of performance you know, just just comes, but it's getting the team and getting those individuals feeling um, that they have the confidence and the feeling that they understand that common goal. That's the hardest bit. But once that's once once that's moving, you know, I've just seen some incredible things be achieved by people, and that and that's that's really exciting and and continues to drive me um, today, and, and I'm sure for for, for for many years to come. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love that. So, so tell me then, how has your ambition evolved over time from that? So from that initial experience. Yeah, I think the, the ambition is one of those things that um, a lot of people can say, oh, I'm not that ambitious. And, and, and they're in, they're in you know, uh, either very senior roles or they've had a very successful, you know, uh, career or, or, or very successful uh, pers personal life. But I think ambition does evolve over time. Um, so, you know, when I was um, coming out of, 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 of school at age 16 or 17 and I was thinking about what I wanted to do, you know, I wanted to wear a pinstripe suit and, and wear a, and, and drive a Vauxhall Cavalier and be a travelling salesperson. That for me was that would be the absolute, you know, pinnacle of what I wanted to do. I'd be happy. I'd be out. I'd be travelling. I wouldn't be in an office. I'd be engaging with people. Um, and of course, you know, that 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 was achieved in my in my early twenties. Um, and then your ambition moved a little bit further. And I wanted to work for bigger organisations, bigger brands. You know, more more well known organisations. And that wasn't necessarily because of the brand, but I, I felt that was an opportunity to secure my career, but also be able to kind of do more of that problem solving on a, on, on, on a much big, big, bigger scale. Um, and so through my 20s, I worked for a, a, a number of different organizations and became a, you know, that field salesperson and then a sales manager. Then I joined a, 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 a UK based business, the SCC, that many, many of your listeners will know. Um, which was a private business, but I mean, you know, a 400 million pound business, but still a private business. Um, and so again, you know, sales management was a focus and then eventually, eventually joining, you know, what I thought would be the organization that I would stay with probably for the rest of my life was, was Compaq at the time, you know, huge organization, all sorts of opportunities. And I think, you know, ambition at that point was, 
I'd love to be a sales director. You know, being a sales director would be fantastic. And I remember sitting in one of our quarterly sales meetings, looking up at the sales director, talking to 100 salespeople and talking about quarterly results and the vision. And I thought, you know what, that would be, would be fantastic. And of course, these things just move on five years later, 10 years later, you know, you're doing those roles. So I think it's really important to always have your ambition lines set in a short and short to medium term, um, because I think that makes it achievable. And then actually the rest, the rest of your ambition and the rest of those roles will just sort of take care of themselves. I think if you set yourself a goal that's almost too lofty and too far out, it becomes unattainable. So I've always sort of set reasonably short term goals um, and, and just then really, really focused in the moment. And if you focus in the moment, my, my view is everything else will just will just take care of itself. But but yeah, ambition is important. Um, and some people wear it very much on their sleeves and some people have it very, very quietly within them. And, uh, and, and both and, and, and both, uh, both are valid. And, and what I like about that as well, or you said about setting short and medium term goals, is that sometimes um, people have like a 10, 20 year plan, but actually my view on that is if, if it's too um, rigid, let's say, it's almost like you can potentially miss out other opportunities along the way. And what you've just shared there is that you kind of had ideas of where you wanted to go, but opportunities would come up along the way. You'd look at that and think, actually, I'd like to do that, something like that, that kind of run, then you work towards it, which gives a bit more fluidity, I guess, to, to the roles and, and, and also not missing out on potential opportunities which you wouldn't ever have considered before. I agree. And, and I think you can sometimes get stuck on titles as well, as opposed to actually the roles. Um, and I think there's probably only once in my career where I've been very, very focused on a, on a title. Um, but mostly it's what does that what does that role give me? You know, what what additional skills am I going to learn? What um, uh, you know, what what base is that going to give me for my next for my next move? And so I'm always looking for adjacencies. I'm always looking for something that's going to add another adjacency to what I'm doing at the time. But again, it's very understandable. And, you know, I keep kind of use it, you know, if a headhunter asks you in five years time, why did you do that role? You need to be able to explain it really clearly. Or if you if you're going to take a very different different course uh, because you want a change and you want to do something different. Again, which of your skills are transferable? Because I think if you don't have that, you spend the first year or two drowning and not really knowing. But also when you think about it, if you're trying to build a career or you're trying to build a, um, a personal ambition, you know, you, you don't want to continue to, or continually do things that are just going to put you in such a place of challenge that your opportunity for success is limited. Yeah, yeah. And again, something I, I, I talk about a lot is, is when people come to me and say, oh, you know, I want to be, I, I use an example like a business analyst. Um, OK, what does that actually look like? Because a business analyst that, let's say, HP is very different from a business analyst at IBM or Dell or wherever, you know, and yeah. it's what do you want to be doing? What does that day or week look like? You know, do you want to travel? Do you want to be engaging with external people? Whatever. But yeah. actually really understanding what it is you want. So to your point, that the, having the skill set, what are the skills that you want to gain? Not just about the job title. I think a lot of people do focus too much on just job titles as they're moving up rather than what they want to be doing and how that's going to serve them going forward yeah and I think you also have to be prepared that there will be some periods in your career where you will have to move sideways for a period of time before you move up so to get those skills um you know you are a risk for your your new employer or for the, the, the organization or the entity that you're moving into and I've done that a couple of times where I have moved out of a traditional uh, either sales role into either a service delivery manager role for a couple of years or into a general manager role. But they were because I knew I was lacking a certain skill, an operational skill, um, managing a P&L, whatever that may, may, may be. Um, and that maybe has had no, little or no impact on my um, financial progression but actually it's been an investment year or two because I've known those skills are going to set me in, in, in good stead and I would I would absolutely encourage people to think about that sideways move as long as it's part of a you know a, 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 a three to five year plan for where you really want to go next and, and that's key to make sure you're not just thinking about the next role but you're thinking about the role ahead and that's you know coming back to, 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 to a question I think you asked earlier was you know, what is the best piece of advice? Always think about not the next role, but the role after that. And then you'll never get yourself stuck in a corner or a cul-de-sac because you're always thinking about, well, what, what impact does that have? And that that served me very, very well over, over my career. 
Yeah, and I like that. I like that approach. And something that just popped into my mind there is, you know, we often hear people saying um, or being told that they can't move into a particular role because they don't have the experience. So where you just explain there that you've moved into, let's say, general manager role to gain certain experience, how has that conversation gone when you've expressed that interest if you've not got the experience? Or, or what would you recommend what's the approach to take to be considered if you have because I've been I've done that right I've gone from accountancy corporate finance sales okay and and so it's worked for me but a lot of people I hear so well I've been told I don't have experience I can't that they won't be considered yeah and and, and there is a, there's a there's um a, there's a level of confidence and there's a level of personal brand that you need to consider don't you but I think you need to be able to demonstrate even if it's in the smallest way that you've managed to make that transition already so it could be a transition that you look at just within a, a, the role that you're doing at the moment. It could be a skill that you've taken on proactively. Um, it could be that you are going to position that that change because of, you know, the longer term change that you want to make. And that ambition on uh, in its own and that and that foresight and, um, is, is enough for people to say, you know what, clearly this individual isn't just kind of taking this role because they think it's a step up or it's because it's part of a wider plan. But I think the smallest of demonstrations of stepping outside of your current profession, current role um, in an interview, for example. And remember, we're talking about probably a minute or two of explanation, more than anything, um, and thinking about that and being able to demonstrate it and getting the getting the hiring manager nodding um, is, is, is absolutely the, 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 the key part. Um, I also think that if you are thinking about doing something very different, you know, these are, are not thoughts you have overnight. Generally, there are things that, that, that take two, three, four months to come. So are there other opportunities for you to, to demonstrate that? So I can remember, you know, I was in a role uh, when I was working for HP where I took on the um, the London site manager role. Now, I had no desire to really think about all of the all of the, the mundane parts of that role, but I knew it was much more of a general manager type activity, thinking about real estate, thinking about people engagement, Thinking about um, uh, thinking about expense uh, expenditure um, and all of those things were going to stand me in really really good stead when I knew I was going to want to go and do a P and L stroke GM role um, because it was outside of the day job but it was very much a GM function. So looking for those opportunities and again they might be very very small and I encourage people to do that today. But what can you show outside of your day job because I think that just shows the inclination and therefore you're you're, you're willing to take that risk and and deliver on it. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. And I, I like that approach as well. So what do you wish, if anything, that you'd known when you started out? Um, I think I carried for a very long time, um, even though I academically I was pretty turned off and I and I, I walked away from, from, you know, school and college with very little. I carried that on my shoulder a very long time that I thought it would hold me back. Um, you know, it was it was it was definitely one of those things in my psyche, which is oh, I don't have a degree, I don't have A levels, therefore there is a feeling that I'm going to reach, and 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 some of that was um, reinforced by some HR leaders, um, and some of it was completely uh, admonished as well. So so I think letting that go in my kind of early 30s or, or early to mid 30s allowed me to kind of um, thrive actually, but but certainly for for 15 years of my career. I was convinced that, you know, if I didn't have X, Y and Z, I would never, I, I would only progress to a certain point. Um, and I, um, it's funny, the same things that, that, that hold you back drive you as well, because, you know, I was, I was absolutely determined to prove people, um, you know, whoever those people are, are wrong that, that you could achieve, but I, but I definitely held it. So, so going back to that first point, if you focus on, on what lights you up, you focus on what really, really gets you going and, and, and makes you your best self, um, that, that that mostly will always you know um, uh, cover any shortcomings you also might think you have as well yeah totally I, I really like that and um, a question I've got there what was it what was the turning point that allowed you to let that go I think um, I can remember being on some kind of management course and part of that management course was um, a, obviously engaging with your peers, and this was around all of Europe, so you know, uh, individuals from lots of different areas. And part of that was having a career chat with a, um, a, an EMEA head of HR. So, you know, some lofty individual who is going to either set your career on, 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 on file or not. Um, and um, 
I sat down with this individual and we chatted about it and I and I articulated what my ambition was in in, in the business. Um, and he said, well, I, I, you know, I really don't think we would put people in that at that level that don't have a degree. And I and I and it was the first time someone had ever actually said that to me, even though I've been sort of carrying this in my uh, in, in, in my head. Um, and I kind of, you know, that just um, that just rather than dampening my enthusiasm, just completely flipped it for me just completely said well there's you know there's another there's, there's another people person that i'm going to going to completely convince wrongly uh, uh that, that they're wrong and for me it was that it was that drive and then again just extending and, and thinking about the people um in business that i respected thinking about the people in my own organization externally you know the people that you read about in the Sunday Times or the or, or or a business magazine, and just doing a bit of research into all of those background because you almost I almost needed that. Okay, is that really true, or actually, are, are all these people out there being successful without degrees? And there is such a huge amount of people that have not, you know, or, uh, have, have not kind of followed that academic route and and, and are still um, are still enjoying success. So so it's interesting. It was uh, being told no again is what actually kind of released that uh, re released that issue. Yeah, brilliant. And, and, you know, some people can be so easily influenced by that and being what you keep mm -hmm. getting told us, uh, coming back to what you said, earlier, it's about really getting connected with your passion and what you love and yeah. what you want to do and be that determined, committed and focused to it that no matter how it, it's like sales, right? How many no's you keep getting, you keep yeah. going until you get a yes, but you, you've got to keep going, right? So for me, one of the foundations of, of a strong personal brand is identifying your core values. So what are your core values? What do you stand for? What are your non-negotiables? Yeah, I think, um, again, it's one of those things that um, they don't necessarily change over time, but they are honed over time. I think they're really sharpened. Um, and, and I think it's, um, for me, loyalty is huge. Uh, my own loyalty, uh, not only in my, in my, in my professional um, uh, relationships, but in my personal relationships as well. Um, so loyalty is a big order. And again, I think loyalty works both ways. I think that um, as a manager um, or as a head of a family or as a sibling, I think you have a real, you have a, re a responsibility to do exactly what, you're saying, what you say you're going to do. You know, you really, really have to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. Um, <clears throat> but that's in even sharper focus um, in an organisation. And I I consistently say to employees that join me today, you know, thank you for putting your trust in Aptitude Software or me for your career, because it's a really, it's, it's a huge engagement, isn't it? That somebody is going to bet their career on your business or your leadership or the general managers that you, you have in your team as well. Um, but I think it works the other way as well. You know, my loyalty to my employees, my loyalty to my investors, my loyalty to my peers is also really, really important. But and it, but it comes back, back, back to the getting up every day, wanting to do the best you can do. Um, and I think if you can engender that in everybody, then actually that life becomes easier. That I think I think it's Richard Branson that says, you know, focus on your employees first, and your and your and, and your customers will take care of themselves. And I'm a massive believer in that. So so uh, hopefully um, hopefully people feel that. Um, with that comes courage. Um, I think courage to um, lead, courage to say no, courage to um, face up to the really, really hard things. Um, former CEO uh, that many people will recognise, Meg Whitman used to say, run to the fire. That's something that I've carried with me, you know, for, for, for the last decade. You know, if something um, smells bad, it is bad. If something was at the bottom of your inbox and it's difficult, it is. So go and tackle it straight away because those things never, ever get any better. Um, and if you shy away from them, they they get out of control. And once they're out of control, that's really hard. So having the courage to, uh, to 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 attack those things, but also having the courage to to set a course where you might not have a hundred percent of the answers, but you know you need to be the individual that says, okay, we will figure the last twenty percent, ten percent, fifteen percent out on the way. But you know what, we we we've, we've got enough data, uh, we've got enough business experience to say that this is the right direction. You know, because not doing something is, 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 is much, much worse. So having that courage and being the person that's prepared to stand up and say, this is the direction we're going to go uh, is, is also really, really important to me. And not just to me, but to people around me as well. Um, it, it, if I can't see that in people, I worry about their, their, their conviction. Um, third one, curiosity. Um, 
as a child, um, much to my parents' disgust, whenever I was uh, bought a new tie for Christmas, first thing I did was take it apart. Couldn't always put it back together again. Um, but it was always about, well, how does this work? What happens here? And I think that curiosity comes through. It's curiosity in um, in individuals. It's curiosity in business. It's curiosity in industries. Um, and I think I think that is a real big part of human nature. Um, that it's not it's not rude to ask questions. People actually really enjoy, you know, be, 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 being able to talk about things that they are um, possibly an expert on or something. You know, so curiosity is a big one for me. Um, thinking around corners. Uh, aptitude software one of our values is a uh, be one think ahead um which is which uh, again is you know how can we, how can we be ahead of our clients all of the time so actually we are uh, trying to second guess where their problems are going to be so we can solve them before they get and i think that's all about curiosity as well um and then the, the, the final one is humility um you know you you just have to be yourself you, you have to be human um i think credibility comes from failure as well as success and how you handle some of those things. So I think um, showing the, the human side of, 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 of you and that um, things are never all perfect is really, really important because I think that um, vulnerability um, is a huge source of a trust um, uh, for people as well. So, um, so I hope I'm the same at work as I am in the pub, as I am at home with my family, that there's sort of, there's, a, there's only one Jeremy really. Yeah, yeah. And so just picking up on, on courage there and, and curiosity, what because sometimes you need that courage when you've got big decisions to make. So so what one question do you ask yourself when you've got a big decision to make? Uh, I ask myself two questions, actually. Uh, how would this look on the front of the Financial Times? So could I stand behind this if it was a decision that, that was a public decision? Um, and how would I explain it to my parents? Because I think those two things keep you completely grounded about are you doing something that is in for for the the interest, the public interest or the interest of your employees, your stakeholders, um, and therefore how would it play out? How would you feel if it played out? And secondly, I think if you can explain it to your parents who are not in your world, then that also keeps you grounded on the decision making as well. That's brilliant. I love those. <laughs> Take those on board. <laughs> And so what level of importance do you give to surrounding yourself with a, a professional network? Um, it is important to have a professional network, but, but not for having a professional network sake. Um, so for me, I think um, having a set of trusted um, individuals who um, Either our peers, or in many cases, are are um, are, 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 are you know ahead of you in, in in life in some shape or form, but also making sure that you're investing in your own per professional network. You know, below you sounds an awful word, but younger than you is also really really important. Um, and I would say I probably have a half a dozen individuals who I reach out to if I've got some tough um, tough decisions that I maybe want to talk through. Uh, I think when I when I left HP after 15 or 16 years, I realised that my professional network was was nowhere big as, as as maybe I thought it should have been. But actually, the people that I did engage with you know, knew me very well. That I knew them very very well, um, and therefore a recommendation out. So so they're putting their personal credibility on the on 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 the line to make a recommendation out um, was what what's most most important. Um, I. I do not network um, um, naturally. If I walk into a, a room of 100 people, I have to take a very, very deep breath and think, right, okay, how am I going to make this make make this room work? I know a lot of people will say, well, that just looks natural, Jeremy, you know I mean? but it's not. I have to work really, really hard at it. Um, but I think it's important that you keep that you, you keep that network um, reasonably tight, uh, and again, you build that trust and you build that credibility, and you make the time. When you're when you're asked to respond that uh, uh, respond to people, um, I'm a big believer in the pay it forward phrase. So you know you pay it forward, it will absolutely come back to you. And I've always believed that for the last you know gosh 30 40 years that you know you might need to put yourself out today, but that will come back to you in in uh, in, in multiples. And, and that's been that's been a huge belief, uh, a huge um, uh, beneficial thing for me. Um, but yeah, it's it's I'm, I'm not a professional networker. Half a dozen great people. In, in other industries that are not necessarily connected with what I do, uh, because I think you also need to hold a mirror up to yourself occasionally as well. Yeah, 
And, and would you say then that, that there are benefits to um, to having or surrounding yourself with that network and advancing your career? I think um, there's some crazy fact, isn't there, that 60 percent of executives get their get their next role because they know somebody or because they've been recommended into something. Um, I can tell you that when I went out looking for uh, a new role um, after leaving HP and I had six months out, but purposefully, you know, time away, um, uh, people were very, very generous with their time um, and very generous with that, with that coffee and that half an hour. And, and, but it's, uh, for me, the work you need to do yourself, you still need to join the dots yourself. Um, I think I visited 22 headhunters during my time that, that I was at, out sort of looking for a new role. And bizarrely, the one headhunter who I chose not to engage with um, for, for historical reasons um, actually wound me up. And, and that's how I ended up with, with the aptitude role. So I think your professional network sometimes is at work, even if you don't know it's, even if you don't know it's there. Um, but, but certainly the ability to, to um, uh, run ideas around with people just ask for that very a very simple simple introduction is important but I don't as I say I don't think you need it at scale I think you need a set of a small set of people who know you very very well um otherwise it's just um you know it's just a melee isn't it of, uh, of people yeah. and recommendations and, and stuff mm, no it's definitely it's definitely and so then when it comes to leadership and personal leadership what core traits do you feel exhibit good leadership and I think you've probably mentioned a few of those already but what specifically yeah I think um authenticity really important and that sort of comes back to the humility stuff i think you know being authentic is is hugely important and that means knowing your own um limitations having a high level of self-awareness um is really really important and, and not assuming that you know all the answers all the time um i think you have to be very consistent i think you know you can't have uh, one voice to your um to your employees or your or your or your team another voice to your clients and another voice to your investors so that consistency is is really really important and it's consist has to be consistent at your leadership team level at your board level or at your new joiners level um the, the highlight of, of of my month is i do a i do a uh, what is a teams call with all of our new joiners so every month get together for, for an hour and sometimes there can be seven people on that call sometimes there can be 17 you know, we're a high growth business so there's a lot of people coming in but you know the voice i hope that i speak on, on to, 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 to them with my with my with my investors and i think that's really really important um collaboration um uh, you know we all know that you cannot over engage with your with your stakeholders particularly in the last 18 months, you know, you, you, we've all done too many kind of, you know, a cocktail hours and too many online quizzes, but real collaboration, you know, where you are with, where, where you really try to help solve, solve, each, solve each other's challenges um, is it, just huge. And I think collaboration comes in lots of different ways. We had our summer party um, last Thursday in London. First time we've had all of our London employees back together. We had 40 or 50 people um, in the office. We normally have about 80 or so in, in, in the UK. But as I walked through the, the office, you know, people were sitting on sitting on tables. They were having kind of they were having huddles. They were stood in the in the stood in the uh, in, in the in the corridors. And at the party in the evening, someone said, "Well, I've got no work done today. I've, I've just got no work done." I said, "You've got so much work done today. You just don't you don't know it." But all of this will come back in the next week or two because those five minute conversations, those little huddles, those let's just jump in a meeting room. That collaboration is huge. And, and frankly. I'm a big believer that you just don't get that in this environment. Um, so finding ways to collaborate again and, and relearning collaboration is, is really important. And as leaders, we have to we have to deliver that. Um, you know, you almost need to treat every time you're back in the office as an offsite, because you know that 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 is a very different engagement to where we were 18 months ago. And then final one is being results orientated. It, you know, you can be as collaborative and as consistent and and as engaging and as human as you want to be, but at the end of the day. Um, leadership is about results and that could be employee scores it could be revenue it could be profit it could be shareholder value um, it could be um, you know increasing the number of releases that you're delivering uh, out of your software business or improving your SLAs but you have to be results oriented because when it comes down to it that is that, 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 that that's essentially what you're here to deliver so you know making sure all of those sort of soft elements are underlined by the results that you uh, are expected to deliver and and also that you've locked hands with your team on to deliver as well because because no, no one does this alone yeah 
I uh, totally agree with you. And I, I, I like those points. So authenticity, consistency, collaboration and results oriented. So just come back to collaboration for a second. Um, and again, this is partly from my own experience, but also hearing what other people will say around this. So pre-COVID, let's say, you'd be in the office, people would be chatting. And oftentimes what I noticed was, because I tend to just chat to anyone I bump into, but there are a lot of people who only chat to the people in their team or the people they sit next to. I, for example, we hot desked. So we would, although most of our team were together, there'd be other people who would come and sit there. Um, and in some cases, like you, I would sometimes try to make conversation, they wouldn't talk to you for the entire day, which I found really bizarre. Um, so how can you encourage more of the collaboration and the almost the connection and networking outside of your immediate team or the people that you have to work with? So you just get to understand what other people are doing, get to broaden your network, to understand the business more. What would you encourage there? Yeah, no, so, so and, and I think that's you know that's going to be even harder in the new world because you know teams are going to come in together on certain days and other teams are going to come in other other days and so and so that kind of they that osmosis of collaboration that goes on when lots of teams are in the office all at the same time is is, is going to be harder and, and I think that comes down again to um, personal leadership and I don't necessarily mean someone that's got a team of twenty it's a, it's a, it's a case of how am I going to learn about uh, learn about the business that I'm part of that I've joined um, and so that comes down to courage it comes down to being you know uh, being able to go and ask that question and curiosity going and, and, and asking that question of somebody you know I don't quite get what you do I've heard this on the latest all hands how does that fit in a certain element um, because I think that in the last 18 months we've all been very used to taking our information downwards so we've had to have quite a lot of instruction whether it's from the World Health Organization, whether it's been from our governments, whether we agree with the the uh, the the the, uh, the direction we've been given or not, um, and so we, uh, and again, certainly at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, again, we were telling our employees to please go home and work, please do not travel, please do not, and so we have to unwind that, we have to unwind that so that people, you know, go, go back to asking questions of each other, go back to answering questions of, of the leadership team. We use some technology today that allows people to ask questions um, on, a, on a consistent basis as part of their employee engagement. The same thing ahead of our all hands calls. Um, one of the big things that I encourage teams to do is to do uh, all hands with each other's leaders. Um, so I ask my leaders to go in a pair. So I might ask my head of product or my head of sales to go and just do an in conversation with my head of with my services, uh, my services uh, team. So again, people get to observe and hear uh, the sort of things that, that, that are discussed. But we have to work really, really hard because the collaboration will not be there naturally. The teams will not be there naturally. And we'll only have 60 percent of the time to physically collaborate because no one's going to be in the office Monday and Friday. Everyone's going to be in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So we have to work out how to make that time really, really valuable. Mm, yeah. And I guess, as you said, things have changed so much now. It's almost you've really got to plan it and, and be a bit more strategic around it now. It's not that natural. Yeah. Just show up in the office and everybody's there anymore. Yeah, and, and I, I think it will come back. Um, I think um, eventually we will we will relearn all, all of those elements. We're really lucky that, you know, we had a, a, a lease expiry on our, our, our not only our London office but a number of our offices over the next 18 months so we have the opportunity to recreate what the office environment is going to look like um, and recreate collaboration spaces you know put technology in that allows us to collaborate uh, you know in a, in a hybrid manner um, but that is a, that's you know that is an opportune 10-year lease event that we're having in our London office our Poland Rostov office and also in our US office um, if, if we didn't have that, I'd still be thinking about how we would reimagine that office environment so that people are coming back to something that is different because the worst outcome would be I walk into the office and I've got 50 people all sitting with headphones on, all sitting looking at uh, look, looking at, at Teams or, or Zoom screens because, you know, we would have went to choose anything. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And so you talked about um, personal leadership and being results oriented. So how do you define career success for you? I think on a personal level it's um always adding skills um so and sometimes that's daily sometimes it's weekly sometimes it's every quarter sometimes it's a year but but for me um my need 
and, and that curiosity to keep adding skills is, is is very much there. I have a dynamo inside me, um, which kind of is always, well, hang on, have, have I learned something today? Is that something different? Have I been challenged? Um, and I think, you know, I used to sort of know that, that 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 period of time was probably two to three years before I needed a different role to do that. I think that elongates, um, you know, as, as you go through your career. And so I think, you know, I'm probably in a sort of three to five year um, cycle of, of that at the moment. But so, so learning new skills, being challenged, um, you know, using that, using the grey matter in a, in, in, in a different way. And then I think that coming back to the being results, yeah, being consistently delivering results. Um, and again, consistency isn't necessarily about just a quarter or just a six months. You know, in, in, in my, my role, I'm thinking about, well, what does my business need to look like in three years time and in five years time? What impact is that going to have on my employees, on, on you know, the investors that have, uh, have put their trust in us, um, on, on my prospects and my clients? So, you know, are we making progress towards a goal? Um, there's never going to be a straight line. You know, straight line progress is hugely, hugely unusual. Um, but can we see, can, can we see that, that progress over time? And if that all happens, then actually, again, the next step in my career or the next role or the next adventure will sort of take care of itself. And so I, I worry less about am I making progress personally? Um, because I think if I'm getting that stimulation day to day and I'm showing progress against the, the results that I'm, um, I've set myself, then, then, then it should be great. And I love that. That's a great a couple of questions there to ask yourself at the end of the day. So have I been challenged today? And what have I learned? Or have I learned what have I learned that's new today? Yeah, yeah. And recognize the good days and the bad days. Some mm. days you'll, you know, you'll walk away from your, your, your Zoom screen or you'll work away from the office and 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 you're gonna be frustrated and, and angry and you know want to go home and and uh, and and and, uh, and, 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 and I suppose kick, kick the cat you probably not allowed to say that anymore but uh, but actually also walk out when you walk out the office and you want to punch the air and say you know what I'm having a great day today um and my my chief delivery officer um during one of his his mid-year reviews you know what I could sometimes come out and say you know what this company is lucky to have me and I think you must recognize those days as well um and if you whether it's reflection on the train on the way home, on, on, on a run on, on an evening, the walk to the bus, whatever it is, just find that little bit of time to say, how, how has today been? So. Mm, yeah, definitely. And tell me about one of the biggest challenges that you overcame in your career. Um, there's probably a couple. Um, I think probably one of the ones, one of the ones that probably has, um, allow me to thrive in what I'm doing um, probably is is um, in my in my previous role uh, when I was just when I was at HP uh, we had some uh, very difficult contractual relationships with a, with a client um, and it was a very new client it was a, a prospect who was going to put their trust in, in in us as a business to provide the very first um, cloud enabled financial services application in the UK so it was a building society and they were going to move all of their core mortgage systems onto um, a private cloud. Uh, and and they say, this is 20, 2012. So this was unheard of. You know, the regulators hadn't talked to anybody that was going to do this. And so understandably, the contractual negotiations were, were, were challenging and they were tough. Um, and when we got through to kind of the final points or two, um, limits of liability was, was a big one, understandably. You know, this is a financial services organisation. They look after people's money. Um, we were a technology organisation and, and, and the, the business wanted unlimited, unlimited liability, which was something we were, we were never going to, to agree to. Um, I, got a, I got a call on a Friday afternoon. I was heading up to Yorkshire to see my parents uh, for the weekend. Uh, I had a pair of shorts on, a pair of trainers and a, and a, and a polo shirt. And I was, I, was, I was instructed that I needed to go and see the CEO of this building society on, um, on the Monday. And I said, well, first of all, you clearly prepare me over the weekend. Um, but you know what? I don't have a suit. I don't have a tie with me. You know, I'm, frankly, I'm not prepared, proposing to to go and buy all, all, all of that stuff. Um, but I agreed. I agreed to go and to go and see Peter, uh, who was the CEO of the Building Society. Um, I, I kind of thought about it all weekend, and I kind of thought about the decision that he was having to make, and the again the trust he was going to put in in, in, in us as a business, the, the conversations he would be having having with his stakeholders, his board. Um, and, you know, I decided that the only way really to, to address this issue was a way of really understanding what was driving, driving the requirement and actually sort of doing a very sort of consultative approach. And I went back to a, 
a book, probably the only business book I, I kind of rely on, um, which was Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of, um, of Effective People. Um, and I went and reread the consultative questioning chapter because I kind of thought, you know, we've got to get, we, I've got to get to a point whereby we, we, we find that we find a middle ground here. Um, I was probably in my mid to late thirties, maybe late thirties at this point. Um, and, you know, very rarely had I gone back to a piece of um, uh, academic or scientific approach to kind of meet one of these requirements, but I did. And I, and I, and I thought it through and I thought about my questioning and, and then I did buy a pair of chinos, but I did turn up in, in, in his office in a pair of trainers and a pair of chinos and a polo shirt and um, and made my apologies and sat down and, and started to ask questions of Peter about, you know, you know why was it important? Um, actually, what was what was underpinning what was underpinning the business decisions for what we were doing? Um, and through that conversation, sort of 45 minutes of questioning and, and apologizing for for just for just asking questions and not not solving this problem what unveiled was a whole business strategy about um, segmental lending. So as a mortgage business going off to fund some higher profitable clients by looking at very specific segments that were underserved in the market, uh, a whole e-commerce strategy, a whole digital strategy, a whole strategy around uh, working with, with, with mortgage brokers. Um, and once we'd had that really fantastic business conversation, um, Peter said, there's all sorts, there's, there's lots we can talk about here. Let, let me just ask my COO to go away and see if we can fix this problem. And uh, Karen left the room, came back and um, and agreed that there was a way that they could manage that liability through their own internal insurance. So they could lay off that risk or they could do something. Whether that actually happened or not, I don't know. And we went on to have a very, very fruitful relationship. I mean, that was a significant deal for the client because it was the same. It was, it was uh, the first cloud engagement. We had a significant engagement over the next five to six years, but less about the the revenue that that generated for me as a business, more about the really interesting and exciting things we got to do with that client that we never would have done if we'd sort of just gone in and, and just given a flat no. And, and even more importantly, when I joined Aptitude Software, uh, Peter actually acted, acted as a personal reference for me as well um, to, to my board. So I think that, you know, sometimes really, re really evaluating how you're going to address a specific issue, which might seem as a very, a very negative starting point, but really getting underneath the reasoning for that can just completely transform um, a relationship, how you think about your career, how you think about your engagement. And so, you know, that ability to really put a consultative approach into all of my work um, just was, 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 was a massive game changer for me. Yeah, incredible, incredible turnaround there. And yeah, <laughs> going up on your chinos as well. So you're already on the back foot. <laughs> yeah, well, but again, it's being human, isn't it? It's kind of, you know, I didn't expect to have this meeting. I've not put on a power suit. This is me, right? I've just, I've just, you know, and this is me who you're going to deal with for the next, whatever it was, um, yeah. for five or six years. So. Most definitely, most definitely. And how has an apparent failure set you up for later success, would you say? Um, I think you you must must be close to the detail. Um, you must um, not necessarily assume everything that somebody is telling you is absolutely right, and you must use your curiosity to you know double click on something if it doesn't if it doesn't look right. So I said earlier about something doesn't smell right, it probably isn't right, and so really you need to follow your um, follow your uh, your instinct. Um, I was transitioning in a role. Um, with uh, with somebody taking on the the, uh, the running of a very large uh, large account, um, and the outgoing the outgoing leader was going on to another role and would become one of my um, stakeholders essentially. He he would be providing service to me, a, a gentleman who was great friend now, um, but actually you know there was a service we were going to deliver to our client, and this service came through with um, an extraordinary positive margin so the profit that this, this deal was going to make was extraordinary really. and and this is I, I kind of looked at like, that that just feels almost double what it should be and everyone said oh it's okay don't worry this is just fantastic well this great service client's going to love it we're going to make it work so given I was taking over and I had 80 other priorities I kind of thought you know I don't need to worry about that I can just leave that and I can focus on I can focus on the stuff that I do need to about three three weeks later I got a call to say yeah, I'm really sorry. Um, we got the dollar and the pound cost the wrong way around. So not only is this deal not making what was 60% margin, it's going to lose 30%. 
Um, and so we need you to go and to go and tell the client we can't we can't we can't do this deal. Um, so remembering, you know, I am a month into a leadership role on a tier one bank, um, trying to build relationships, trying to engage with the CIO and the CTO and the head of delivery, um, and the accountability for that decision was very very difficult to land anywhere within our business. Um, and actually, as the leader of that account, as the leader of that client engagement, as the leader of that sales team, stepping forward to say, well, you know what, okay, I'm going to take it. You know, at the end of the day, I'm the, I'm the person in front of the client. Um, took that on, had some pretty sleepless nights over it, I have to say. Um, it was, you know, probably the low point of my of, 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 of career with that, with that particular client. But again, being human, finding solutions, solving it in another way, um, making sure that we as, we as a business found a way of standing behind our commitment and making money over time um, engendered a huge amount of trust and loyalty um, from that client. And actually that client went on to triple their revenue with us in the next three years. So, so again, yeah, thinking about how that, that failure and thinking about, you know, I should, I absolutely should have gone and double click that number. I shouldn't have just said, it will be okay. I should have gone and followed my instinct and really, really double clicked on that. Um, means means that I would have been able to avoid what was a very, very difficult situation. So, um, so yeah, I don't assume anything on the numbers anymore. I, uh, I go and find them out for myself. <laughs> Easy mistake, but yeah, can be uh, potentially career limiting, right? <laughs> yeah, well, and, and more importantly, you know, we had a client that had, you know, hundreds, hundreds of millions or, or, or tens of millions of pounds of, of technology um, that was going to go in a data center and the data, the, the data center doors were going to be locked, right? I mean, they had project plans, they had migration plans all backed up to, to us delivering this service. And, and it, you know, saying no to delivering this service was have a much bigger impact on than just not making a sales number. It was going to have a huge impact on, on, on what the bank was, was trying to uh, trying to deliver. And that was what that was what kept me awake at night. Wow, goodness me. And, and you mentioned earlier about having courage and having the courage to say no. So how easy do you find it to say no? And do you think this can be career limiting? It's really hard to say no, um, particularly, you know, when you're trying to read collaboration. Um, but actually, my view on it is, is the more you say no, um, the more important a yes is. Because when you say yes, it has much, much more meaning. Um, and people know that you are 100% behind it. Um, worse still is not doing anything. Worse still is a maybe, or worse still is a go and give me some more data. Or you know, I think again, if you if you feel that something is not right for that individual, for you personally, for the organisation, for the client, saying no quickly it means people completely understand where 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 you're, where, where, you're, where you're on the line. Um, I would say that the no's I've said even in my personal career in the last three um, or, or three decades have been way more powerful and have led to much better opportunities than the yeses I've said actually. Right okay and I like what you said there I've just scribbled that down so the more you say no the more important the yes becomes. Yeah, definitely definitely yeah. and I, you know that doesn't mean to say that you you become a no machine but you know, it, it, you just have to be very, very clear that you are. If you are saying yes to something, you are often committing um, resources, um, time, investment. Uh, you often means you have to say no to other things. So you have to really think about all of those things before you can give a blanket yes. And I think, you know, um, distraction in a business or distraction in your career from things that are not important are, are the biggest inhibitor of progress. Um, and so, so being able to you know, um, exclude things so you focus on the most important things uh, is uh, is hugely important, and that does mean that you have to you have to say no. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. And personal branding for me is all, is all about standing out and leveraging your competitive advantage. So, tell me, how would you advise our audience to stand out in a crowded market? I think um, on a personal level, I think you have to be. <laughs> pretty clear pretty early on what you want your legacy to be in any new role and um and I, and I don't mean a legacy in some kind of huge theatrical um uh you know a brass plaque type thing i mean you know what what how are you going to leave your mark at the end of that role um because that is your springboard into your next role or your next your, your next career decision um and i i encouraged 
you know, when I was back at HP, we, we ran the intern and the graduate program. I really encouraged the individuals at the end of the 12 months. What are people going to say? People are going to say, you know, Robert did this or Jenny did this or Mark left this or, you know, without X, Y and Z. And that that, that legacy needs to, to, to not that legacy needs to, to live on much, much more after you. So I think if you think about that very early on in your career, again, that gives you a result to drive towards, even though it might not be a financial result. Um, but it might be a, might be a, something that you know that you can do differently to anybody else. And that just provides you those little um, stepping stones and those stories where you can articulate the difference that you personally made. You know, I hear a lot of people in, in interviews talk about we did this and, you know, as a company, we achieved this. I want to hear what you did. I want to hear the difference that you as an, an individual made. What is it that you did that somebody else couldn't do? Because I'm hiring you. I'm not hiring the team that you worked in. Yeah. Um, and again, that's sometimes hard for people to say, well, yeah, but I don't, you know, I feel like I was part of it. Yes, but you must have been, you must have contributed something unique to that team. Um, and that, that's the bit I want to get to. And that can sometimes take four or five questions. Mm. But I think, you know, those things don't just happen by accident. They are, they're done with some thought and some prep and some planning. And so I like, I like, I like to see people that have thought about that, that bit of legacy um, at the end of year one, year two, year three, whatever it needs to be. Um, and as I say, it doesn't necessarily need to be a financial result. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you there. Something I talk about often is looking at what value do you bring to the table and getting really clear on that. Because um, yeah. sometimes we, we forget and we're just doing and, and not really stepping back to look at that. So, and, 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 and you know when you're a passenger, you know if you're sitting around the table or sitting on a Zoom call and you are just participating and you are not adding value. And frankly, if you are there, because you're just worried about missing out on some information, you know what, you know, it's a waste of your time. It actually is also a waste of the people's time. So, so I think you've got to say to yourself, am I, am I, am I adding value here? No, right. What more productive time can I be spent doing something else? So. Mm, yeah, most definitely. Thank you. And final question, Jeremy, what is next for you on the horizon? Um, I'm sure there's all sorts of things. I am, um, I still feel I'm really at the beginning of my kind of that three to five year, um, uh, um, role that I talked about earlier um, so for me you know focusing in the moment you know we have really ambitious plans at Aptitude Software you know to, uh, to to deliver you know a real differentiated experience for for the Office of Finance and for me focusing on that that day one that month one that progress against my results in the next you know next year two or three will define what I do in the future I'm I've just turned 50 um, you get to a, an interesting part in your career when you start counting back rather than counting up. Um, and you never quite know when that happens, but but it's probably around sort of mid 40s. And so there are, you know, there will be longer term opportunities for me, I'm sure, in an advisory capacity or a non-exec capacity or or, or even chair capacities. Um, but right now, um, that that will all take care of itself if I deliver the value to my employees and the value to my clients and, and the, the value to my shareholders. So it's all about um, the next year or two. And frankly, it's all about uh, it's all about delivering the next quarter as well. Yeah, of course. It's always the next quarter. Right? <laughs> yeah. Jeremy, thank you so much for being so very open, engaging, honest and sharing so much value with our audience today. It's been an amazing conversation. No problem, Leela. Thanks very much. I hope it's I hope it's valuable for people. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please do subscribe to the show so you don't miss any future episodes. And remember to leave a review telling us about your key learnings and what you enjoyed the most. And do share this podcast with your friends and colleagues so we can spread the word on the importance of personal branding when it comes to your career advancement. And also ensure that others can benefit from these invaluable insights from many inspirational leaders. I will be eternally grateful. And if you are looking to earn more money, to get promoted, to secure your next role and advance your career, and would like me to support you personally on that journey to get you there, then reach out to me and let's arrange a chat. Alternatively, why don't you check out my personal branding launchpad, a group training and mentoring program. Finally, if you'd like to connect with me directly, then do reach out and direct message me on LinkedIn. You can find the link as well as any other resources mentioned in the show notes. I'll see you next time.